Ryan Robertson, in the summer of 2007, two brothers and a buddy set sail from La Paz, Mexico, not to see land again for 24 days. Their destination, Nuku Hiva, in the Marquesas archipelago, some 5,000 nautical miles away. The departure marked the end of countless hours of painstaking preparation and represented a liberating moment as the three adventurers ripped up landlocked routes. The next three years would see over 70,000 kilometers slip below the keel of their trusty vessel, Kulula, a word meaning to run free in the South African language of Zulu. The three adventurers experienced incredible highs and lows on their voyage. They lived and breathed with the moods of the ocean, from massive storms to stifling hot days. They would spend 371 days at sea. Ryan Robertson, Bryson Robertson, and Hugh Patterson departed on their voyage primarily to find adventure. Secondary to them was a loosely defined goal to explore and catalog the state of remote beaches with respect to ocean-borne plastics. As the voyage progressed, the trio were so shocked at what they found, they refocused the objective of their voyage into one of awareness and education. Please welcome Ryan Robertson. Good evening. So here's a point to ponder. We didn't inherit the earth from our forefathers, but we borrowed it from our children. That is something and a quote that has resonated with the three of us all the way through this voyage and actually originates from uh, the west coast of uh, Vancouver, or west coast of British Columbia, from the, from the native people. <laughs> I can't stand here today and tell you that this trip was, didn't originally uh, happen because of hedonistic pursuit of as much remote surf and adventure as we could find. Uh, myself on the far right, my brother in the middle, and Hugh Patterson on the left, just wanted to escape the rat race, get out there, and see what we could find. Everybody has heard about the Great Pacific Gyre now. In those days, uh, not many people knew about it. And as we traveled around the world, we kind of wondered what happened to the plastic in all the other oceans of the world. And uh, turns out, it seems quite obvious at this point, it ends up on the windward shores of all these super remote beaches. So visualize this with me for a second. You've sailed for days and days and days. There's nothing, just endless horizon. All you've got for company is your brother and a friend of yours, conversation, you run out of topics pretty fast. And all of this, you, it's the, the smell of the ocean, the sound of waves lapping up on the hull, and all of a sudden, over the bow comes this picture-perfect island. You anchor on the leeward shore, you row to the beach, you walk around the other side, and you're wondering when last, if ever, anybody has ever, ever set foot on these isles. And the windward shore is just covered in plastic. So as we sailed along, our focus changed we were so immersed in this plastic migration and we realized that the same forces that drive a sailboat around the world, like the winds and the tides, are exactly the same thing that are driving these plastics around the world. And we started to reprioritize our destinations towards beaches that, because we just wanted to find out what had ended up on them mm. based on what we had seen in previous, previous uh, places. So the US, Actually, I'd just like to give a quick shout out to San Francisco here, being the first major city in the US to ban the sale of disposable single-use pop bottles. Yeah. Just happened yesterday. <laughs> Gregor Robertson, take note. Anybody, this, this image speaks volumes, and the next slide will tell you what exactly it is. That is what two million pop bottles look like, one layer deep. 
That is how many pop bottles the US uses every five minutes. So what do you do about that? <laughs> it's incredible. As we, as we sailed around, we would seek out the most remote beach we could find and look at, just pick up a randomly selected 100 meter stretch of coastline and start cataloging everything. Uh, one of the most impactful things that, that I can tell you is picking up the sand and looking what, you know, on the outlier would just seem like uh, some really, really colorful sand. And then when you start to dig through it, you realize that the sand is actually little tiny pieces of plastic that has come over the reef and been broken up into tiny little pieces and now has just, is inundating itself and bur getting buried layers and layers down. So we came up with something called the Ocean Jibe Garbage Study. Uh, we, we, I think we ended up with 76 super remote beaches, which actually, in hindsight, doesn't seem like that many a number, but every single one of those beaches was pretty hard to attain. And uh, we pondered the solution as we went, you know? Obviously, you can't clean it up. It's just so dispersed with the width and the depth and the, and the breadth of the ocean. Uh, it, it is just, it's impossible. The only real solution, which is what we came up with after countless, countless hours trying to ponder this, is to put the kibosh on the source. You know, in order to change the policy, which is actually what happens, you know, you've got to have the people at the ground level you know, the citizens, the concerned citizens, and the consumers for these large corporations to change. And how do you get that to change? Well, education and awareness. So we launched a campaign kind of partway through called the Ocean Jibe Awareness Campaign and started speaking to kids. We focused on the kids, and incidentally, after speaking to, you know, thousands of kids, they are way more en engaged than the, their adult counterparties. We spoke to kids in Papua New Guinea, in New Zealand, uh, when we went around South Africa, uh, all the way up with the Central America, Cocos Keeling in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And they had, a lot, they had the answers to a lot of the, the questions that, that we, had, we actually had these answers for them, but they knew it already. So what is the big deal about the plastics, really? There's three main things. Like plastic doesn't biodegrade. It photodegrades, meaning like as it sits out there in the UV light, it gets broken up into smaller and smaller pieces and gets distributed on an even wider scope. As it sits out there, the second reason becomes prevalent in that it is a bioaccumulant. It absorbs up to one million times the ambient concentration of toxins in the ocean. And the third is that it looks like food. So all these highly concentrated plastic biotoxin sinks get absorbed and eaten and are getting re-entered into our food chain. And we're just starting to understand the effects of that. Anyway, seven minutes, oh wow, one minute left. Seven minutes is not nearly enough time to really get into this. If you're interested in uh, the full story, way more about the adventure, way more about what it's like to have three super type A personalities caged into a 40 foot vessel with one door and uh, one toilet and no shower. <laughs> we. Uh, we put together a feature-length documentary, which is currently uh, touring the film festival circuit. It was put together by a really good friend of ours, filmmaker Andrew Naismith, and another good friend, Arwen Hunter, as a producer. Um, it'll soon be available on iTunes as well. So, finally, in closing, it, we did not see one single beach out there that was not covered in plastic or had some sort of, some sort of plastic, and we went to a lot of beaches. If everybody had had the experience that we had had out there, we'd, I would not be standing here right now because it would be a no-brainer. Those oceans are so huge and so wide that it's out of sight and out of mind. So spread the word. And uh, thank you to Sean for putting this together and everybody else that made this evening possible. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Thank you. So I Actually, guess only, only the ladies get the hugs? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, we hiked the beaches of... Uh, okay, give me a hug. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was awkward, sorry. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, a, a few years ago, actually, I, I hiked the beaches of, uh, of, of uh, the Nooka Sound, and uh, we started collecting plastic. We just saw it, and bottles, and we had a big garbage bag with us. Okay. And as we went along, uh, within 
I'd say five kilometers, we had a bag about that big full, and we had to stop, and we finally just you know, gave it to a small village that was there. But I agree, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. Northwest Passage this summer as well, we saw all sorts of stuff up there, so it's everywhere. You know, my question for you really is more, you were out there for three years, and um, you know, uh, you, you, once again, you changed, but what was it like to come back to reality, to be a landlubber after being three years on the high seas? Yeah, it's, uh, it was, uh, it's a change, for sure. I'm lucky enough not to have to work at a nine to five on a Monday to Friday, that makes it easier. And I've got a wonderful family now, and two little kids, like you referred to earlier, which some, it makes the time evaporate, but, um, Showers immediately were the big one. You know, being super salty all the time is not that good a feeling. And just the hecticness and the noise. One of the biggest ones actually coming off, to, off, a, off a passage is just the, the earth, the smell of the earth and the smell of the rain and the fresh water is just overpowering to your senses. And then the tra add the traffic and the fumes to that and it's just out of hand. But getting back into the world, uh, you know, it was, it was tough. It's not... Not as good as being out there for sure, but it's just different and it just inspires you to get out there again. Thank you. Thank you.